Hello again. I think that we should uh, start. Uh, we have scheduled two talks uh, for now. Uh, the first talk of this session is approximate, uh, Approximation Algorithm for Estimating Distances in Distributed Virtual Environment. This is uh, the paper uh, co-authored by Tobias Castanet, Oliver Bermond, uh, Nicolas Anus, and Corten Travis. Uh, they are from uh, Bordeaux in France. Uh, okay, let's start. Hello everyone, my name is Tobias Castanet and I will present you in this video our results about approximation algorithms to estimate distances in distributed virtual environments. This is joint work with Olivier Beaumont, Nicolas Anus and Corentin Travers. This presentation will be divided into three parts. First, I will begin by introducing you to the concept of distributed virtual environments. Then I will present you our algorithms and our analyses. And finally, I will speak about our experimental results. So, distributed virtual environments are systems where users share a common virtual world. Typically, each user will control an avatar. And the best example for this is online games, where each user is a player and the avatar will be his character in the game. Usually online games come with a high interactivity as players will interact a lot with the virtual world. And also it is uh, real time in the sense that a player executing an action wants to see the result of the action immediately. We will not need to distinguish a user and his avatar because the difference is implicit. So when we say that a player sends a message, it will mean that it is the user who sends the message. And if we speak about the position of a player, it will mean the position of the avatar in the virtual world. In this virtual world, each player has a state and each player wants to estimate the state of the other players. So they will need the position, the distance that separates them from other players and maybe other information like the remaining life points or the amount of carried money. This estimation of the player states is not straightforward because there may be network limitations. So there may be latency, the size of the messages may be limited and we may want to reduce the number of messages in order to consume less bandwidth. The number of messages may become a problem with a high number of players, so reducing the number of messages is important for a better scalability. This leads us to consider peer-to-peer -peer models who are inherently more scalable. In this work, we focus only on this last aspect. So we make strong hypotheses and we suppose there is no latency, that there are no message losses and that there is a globally synchronized clock. And also we don't take into consideration the duration of the local calculations. The algorithms we propose are to estimate the distances between the players. This is important because in virtual worlds, the precision needs depend usually on the distance. So typically when two players are far away from each other, they will not need as high a precision when estimating the states of each other. This is actually already the case in proposed solutions, for example in Donnybrook, but the distance that is used does not have any guarantee on the error. Also, there may be application-specific uses for example, when implementing effects that affect only close by players like a healing spell. Or if there is a need to analyze competitive video game matches where the distance between players in the same team may be useful. More specifically, we want to have a maximal relative error. So we said we were looking to estimate the distances. That is, each player should estimate the distance between him and every other players while minimizing the message exchanges. 
With the, est the estimated distance and the, act the actual distance, we want that the relative error never overcomes a maximum that we will call epsilon. That is, we want to guarantee for every instant t that the actual distance remains inside 1 minus epsilon times the estimated distance and 1 plus epsilon times the estimated distance. Epsilon is here a given constant value inside 0 and 1. This leads us to our contribution. So we have three results. First, we propose an algorithm we call local change and note ALC that will guarantee that the maximal error is never overcome. Then, we compare local change with an ideal algorithm on random movements and we show theoretically that there is a constant upper bound on the number of messages sent with local change before the first message with this ideal algorithm. Finally, we do experiments on real applications and see that local change is better than a naive algorithm which sends messages at regular time intervals. So now I will present you our algorithm. This algorithm uses a technique called dead reckoning, which allows us to have estimators that are deterministic. This means that a player who sends information about his state to another player will be able to know exactly where the other player estimates him to be. So if we denote by p the actual positions and by p tilde the estimated positions, in this example where we represent the knowledge of player A in blue and the knowledge of player B in red, we can see that both players know both their actual and estimated positions along the estimated position of the other player. So if we call d act the actual distance that is the distance between both actual positions, none of the two players will know this distance. So in our algorithm, the estimated distance we will use is the distance between the two estimated positions that is known by both players. Using this estimated distance, we may satisfy the error constraint using only local information. Our algorithm local change consists in players sending each other their position as soon as one of them sees that the difference between his actual position and his position as estimated by the other player becomes higher than the estimated distance multiplied by epsilon over 2. So if we look at the knowledge of player B, we can represent this by a set of positions that have a distance to the estimated position of player B smaller than this maximum value. As soon as the actual position of B gets outside this set, he will have to send an update. And player A will respond immediately by also sending an update. We can prove quite easily that regardless of the estimation function, the maximal error is never overcome with local change. In order to measure the performance, we will compare the local change algorithm with an ideal algorithm. This ideal algorithm has a total and exact knowledge of the states of the players but cannot predict the future and consists in making the players send each other messages when and only when the error becomes too high. We can visualize this by representing an interval of the allowed values for the actual distance, with ds prime the estimated distance with the ideal algorithm. Messages will be sent only when the actual distance gets out of this interval. We call this algorithm ideal because it is not usable in practice. As we have seen, none of the players knows the actual distance, so no one can detect when to send a message. In the main part of our paper, we look at random movement patterns. We compare these two algorithms and find upper bounds on the number of messages that are sent with local change before the first message with the ideal algorithm. I will now try to give you a very short insight in our method. In order to find these upper bounds, we identify situations where the estimated distance of local change increases significantly. 
So we look only at the instance ti where local change sends messages and see that there is a constant probability that the next estimated distance at time ti plus 1 gets greater than the previous estimated distance at time ti multiplied by a constant. We then see that when this happens successively, the ideal algorithm has to send a message. We can visualize this on the interval by successive hops, corresponding to an increase in the distance between two messages. This leads us to our theorems, which state that there is an upper bound on the number of messages with local change before the first message with the ideal algorithm. We look at two different random movement patterns that I will not describe precisely here, but the first one, random walk, takes place on discrete positions, while the second one is a continuous movement. The exact values of the upper bounds are represented in this table, and all are constant values depending only on epsilon. So now on to the experimental results. In practice, most of the online games use a simplistic strategy that consists in sending messages at regular time intervals. We call this algorithm AFF the algorithm with fixed frequency, where each player waits a fixed number of time steps before sending an update to the other players. The main problem is that this algorithm does not have any guarantee on the maximal error. For the movement of the players, we will use traces from a real game called Heroes of New Earth, which is a two-dimensional game with 10 players. This game is a MOBA, currently one of the most popular genre of online games. We will use these traces to compare the ideal algorithm, local change, and the fixed frequency algorithm. To compare the algorithms in terms of maximal error, we look at the percentage of violations, that is the number of estimates, with a relative error higher than epsilon. Note that there are 10 players, and each one of them has an estimate for each other player. So there is a total of 90 estimates per turn. On the table, you can see the results of the experiments. As we have proven that with the ideal algorithm and local change, the maximal error is never overcome, the percentage of violations is always zero for them. So we don't show these values. This table shows actually two results. First, we compare local change with the ideal algorithm. Local change only sends about four times more messages as can be seen in the two first columns on the left. Second, we compared local change with the fixed frequency algorithm. To do this, we ran local change and looked at the average number of messages per turn. Then we took the same game traces and run the fixed frequency algorithm with a frequency that would result in the same average number of messages per turn. Thus, we can see that using local change allows us to avoid about 2.5% of errors when using the same number of messages with local change and with the fixed frequency algorithm. So to conclude, we have seen an algorithm called local change which keeps the relative error low, while sending few messages. Concerning future work, we are planning to soften the hypotheses. In particular, we think we should be able to add latency to our model while keeping similar results. We are also considering more clever message sending, where player may include in their message recent information about other player. For example, when A has to send a message to B, he may include the last known position of C in the message, improving the precision of B's estimate. So, thank you for listening, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for your uh, talk. Uh, and I have, a, I have a following question. What about um, the situation when we have several players and one of them is malicious or just makes some have some, let's say, problems with, with, with uh, uh, his current position. In other words, uh, how your algorithms can work or 
cannot work in the case if some informations are wrong. Is it possible to handle this uh, using your methodology by using, for example, some redundant information from different players? So, yes, um, actually, we didn't look at this particular problem, but you are right that um, this is a limitation of um, considering peer-to-peer -peer model in distributed virtual environments. And uh, this usually, this security problem is usually um, to cheat when players cheat. So we didn't look at this specifically, but um, this is one of the problems related to yeah. yeah, It's especially important now, I think, because there is something very popular like eSport and there are some um, multiplayer game and this is sometimes involved with uh, not only a sport, but uh, there are a lot of money inside. And for that reason, some people really would like to, 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 to cheat. Uh, anyway, thank you for your talk. It was, uh, it was the, the algorithm is, seems to be very simple, but 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 in fact, it's it's uh, it's something new, and uh, the analysis is definitely non-trivial. And uh, in this case, um, the application is uh, very uh, very clear. So thank you very much. And uh, now we have the last, and of course not least. Uh, talk and this is uh, the talk entitled 3D Coded SUMA uh, communica uh, Communication Efficient and Robust Parallel Matrix Multiplication. Uh, and uh, this uh, presentation is going to be <laughs> presented by Hai Won Jong uh, from Harvard University uh, on behalf of. Uh, 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 as many as eight authors from very decent uh, places. So, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Hei Wan, and today I am going to present our work on 3D Coded Suma, which is a communication efficient and robust parallel metric multiplication algorithm. In this talk, I'm going to introduce a concept called coded computing, which has been a very popular area of research in the information theory community. Coded computing combines two different disciplines, large-scale computing algorithms and information theory coding theory to build reliable large-scale computing algorithms. If you're more familiar with algorithm-based automata and short ABFT, uh, the core concept of coded computing is very similar to ABFT. So uh, let me uh, delve into what I mean by uh, combining these two different disciplines. So traditionally, uh, to build reliable large-scale systems, the most widely used technique was track pointing, where you uh, take snapshot of your computation at a regular interval, so that even if a failure happens in the middle of computation, you can go back to the most recent checkpoint and resume your computation. However, track pointing is inherently a very expensive operation because you have to store all the information about the computation, and in distributed setting, uh, distributed nodes have to be synchronized for track pointing. Another uh, way of building reliability it's replication. So instead of having this one computation system, you can um, build a replica of it, which performs exactly the same computation, so that even if you lose uh, your output from the first one, you can still recover your computation output uh, using uh, the replica. So if you look at this, it seems like a very inefficient solution because you need at least uh, two X uh, redundancy. But in the recent paper at uh, SC uh, 2019, uh, the author showed that replication is more efficient than you think. This is actually the title of the paper. Uh, and in fact, they claim that we might have to use some sort of replication in conjunction with checkpointing in upcoming access scale systems. And coded computing aims to reduce this 2x redundancy of replication. So instead of building a simple replica, can we use some sort of encoding so that we can add just a little bit of redundancy in the encoded input? And then we will uh, put encoded input into the computation system, and it's going to pop out the encoded output, which is going to be a little bit bigger than the original output. And we want to recover the uh, original output through some decoding, even if you lose some part of the encoded output due to some failures. So let me give you an idea of how this could work through a simple toy example of metric vector multiplication. So this is not exactly how metric multiplication is performed on distributed nodes, but bear in mind that this is just a toy example. So here we want to compute metric vector product y equals a transpose x, and we're going to use four distributed nodes. So node one will have a1 transpose x, node two will have a2 transpose x, and so on. 
and we want to add one redundant node. And instead of giving to some part of A, we want to give an encoded input to the redundant processor. So uh, we encode using the simplest form of error code encode here, which is just like taking a checksum. So here, the redundant processor gets A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4. And now let's see what this can achieve. So let's think about a scenario where a node 3 fails in the middle of computation. Then we have y1, a1 transpose x, which is the first part of y, and y2 from node 2, y4 from node 4. Uh, and if you look at the output from this fifth processor, then the output of this is y1 plus y2 plus y3 plus y4. So by subtracting y1, y2, y4 from this output, we can recover the lowest output y3 here. So we have the entire y. And if you were to achieve the same uh, resilience using replication, then you need at least four redundant processors because you don't know which one is going to fail. So you need a replica for each of these. So if you look at the same scenario where node 3 fails, then you can recover y3 from its replica here. So you can see that using error correcting codes can significantly reduce the number of nodes overhead uh, in this example. The idea of coded computing has generated lots of exciting research works in the recent five years. One direction that was studied extensively is coded computing for matrix multiplication, which is what we are going to talk about today. But there are lots of other applications that were studied, such as applying coded computing to distributed optimization or to iterative algorithms, such as finding a fixed point. Also, people have explored different systems where coded computing can be applied, such as blockchain systems, map reduce framework, elastic computing systems, or federated learning systems. So why is coded computing relevant to high-performance computing? So as I just showed through an example, uh, coded computing requires much smaller resource overhead compared to more universal methods like checkpointing or replication, because redundancy is uh, designed specifically for the given algorithm. It doesn't require any disk access, which can be orders of magnitude slower than computation. And coded computing techniques are often very scalable. They um, have this property uh, that uh, the overhead, overhead of coding compared to the total execution time becomes negligible as the number of nodes goes to infinity. And the big advantages of, of using coded computing is that you can build full tolerance at the application level, not in the operating systems level or um, on the hardware design level. So uh, this can reduce the burden of hardware design uh, to build extremely reliable hardware. And it can be easily built into existing libraries such as uh, linear algebra library um, and can, uh, such as uh, in the matrix multiplication function, uh, you can just add one more parameter, fault tolerance. So setting a fault tolerance equals one can be uh, adding redundancy to be resilient to any one failure, or you can set it to two to uh, be resilient to any two failures and so on. And because this is built uh, at the application level, it's agnostic to the underlying system, and the user can very flexibly uh, apply this technique depending on how much fault tolerance you actually want. So this is my take on how coded computing is different from ABFT. So ABFT was first proposed by Huang and Abraham to fight the errors at the circuit level. And this was applied to HPC applications, and the approach there is usually taking the off-the-shelf error correcting codes available in coding theory and apply it to practical algorithms in HPC. On the other hand, coded computing, which started in the information theory community, abstracts out this large-scale computing system and uh, build a simple theoretical model. And based on this, we try to develop a new coding tool, a new error correcting codes designed specifically for this computing model. So I think uh, there is great uh, synergistic effect uh, in going both directions, which is what we are trying to do in this work. So what is this work about? Um, this work is uh, about 3D coded SUMA, which combines meta codes, which are the state-of-the-art coded computing technique for metrics multiplication, and 3D SUMA, which is a widely used uh, communication efficient uh, parallel metric multiplication algorithm. And then we uh, integrate this in a very communication efficient fashion to uh, build 3D coded SUMA algorithm. So uh, let me go over each of these components one by one, and then I'm going to talk about how we combine these two. So uh, let me begin with uh, meta codes. So meta codes is a coded computing technique for 
distributed matrix multiplication. So here, uh, the computation we want to perform is C equals AB, and ABC are all matrices. Uh, and just for simplicity, let's assume that these are N by N matrices. And we want to perform this over distributed nodes. And there are two important parameters um, we define in, in Fourier computing. So one is M, which is a storage constraint, uh, which means that each worker node, each of these nodes, can store only an M fraction of A and B. And K is recovery threshold. So this can be a little bit uh, unfamiliar term. This means the minimum number of successful workers required to recover C. So if K equals four here, it means that if any four of these uh, finish the computation successfully, then we can recover the final output C. So method codes are recovery threshold optimal. So if you look at this graph, uh, y axis is recovery threshold k, and the x axis is George constraint m. And the blue curve here is uh, ABFT uh, technique, which is also uh, rediscovered as product code in uh, 2016 paper. And more recent work uh, in Fourier computing called polynomial codes achieved significantly better recovery threshold for the given storage constraint m. And meta codes um, reduce this recovery threshold even further. And in fact, um, Polynomial codes have recovery threshold of M squared, uh, where M is worse than three, and meta codes have recovery threshold of 2M minus 1. And this 2M minus 1 is later proven to be theoretically optimal. So, how do we achieve uh, such low recovery threshold in meta codes? So, uh, I'm going to go over this really quickly. If you're more uh, curious uh, about the construction of meta codes, I uh, refer you to uh, these papers. So the, the, there are two uh, core ideas behind meta codes. One is it splits matrix multiplication into outer products. So uh, in this case, when M equals two, which means that each node can store half of A and half of B, then we split A vertically and B horizontally. Then C can be written as A1, B1 plus A2, B2. And then the construction of meta codes is an adaptation of reed solomon codes, which is the most well-known and most widely used codes for storage systems. And the construction of Reed solomon codes uh, is based on polynomials. It uses polynomials to perform encoding, and, you, and it uses uh, polynomial interpolation for decoding. And uh, we also use poly polynomials in meta code, but we design polynomials especially for this problem. So we use PA of X for encoding A, PB of X for encoding B, and then the final encoded output will have this polynomial C of X, and then we construct the polynomials in a way that aligns this relevant term in one coefficient in the finer uh, product polynomial P C of X. And what is 3D SUMA? So uh, 3D SUMA is a more communication efficient variant of um, SUMA, which is scalable universal matrix multiplication algorithm. And SUMA is a 2D algorithm, and in 3D SUMA, uh, we add one more dimension. So nodes are placed on a 3D grid, let's say large M by large M by small M grid, and um, we perform SUMA on each layer of our large M by large M grid. And it's also known as 2.5D SUMA. Uh, Solomonic and Demel in 2011 show that uh, 2.5D SUMA is much more communication efficient. Again, to give a really brief overview of uh, the 3D SUMA algorithm, uh, let's look at this example of uh, large m equals 4 and small m equals 2. So it's 4 by 4 by 2 grid. So 3D SUMA also split uh, the matrix multiplication into outer products. So here layer 0 will per perform A1, B1, and layer 1 will perform A2, B2 product. And then uh, they will perform just 2D SUMA on each layer. And at the end of computation, uh, they reduce the first layer to obtain the sum A1, B1 plus A2, B2. Now, um, how do we combine meta codes and 3D SUMA? So you might have noticed that both meta codes and 3D SUMA split the metric multiplication into outer products, A1, B1, A2, B2. Uh, so we can apply meta codes across layers. So now, uh, instead of using just two layers, we can add more redundant layers. So we have four layers here. And uh, recall that the recovery threshold of meta codes was 2M minus 1. So to have any resilience, we should have at least one more than this. So we need at least two M layers. So we are using uh, N uh, equals two M layers here. So instead of having two layers, we have four layers here. And uh, each of these layers will have encoded inputs, A1 tilde, B1 tilde, A2 tilde, 
the tutela and so on, which are encoded using meta codes. And this encoding using meta codes is very communication efficient because encoding is actually done on the first layer and the encoding is done 100% uh, locally, which means we don't need any extra communication for encoding. And then for decoding, uh, decoding is also embedded in the reduce operation, which is already there in the 3D SUMA algorithm. So there is really minimal communication overhead for encoding and decoding uh, for meta codes here. But if you look at this, you can see that the number of layers you need is uh, almost as big as just using replication because you are using four layers instead of two. Then is it really better than replication? So the, the benefit of using MetaCodes actually comes out when we want to build more than single failure resilience. So for a single failure resilience, um, if you use replication, you need to turn up to M layers because you need one replica. And uh, for MetaCodes again, you need at least one more than the recovery threshold, so you need two M layers. But to uh, obtain uh, two failure resilience or one uh, stopped error correction, replication requires three M layers in total because you need three replicas. On the other hand, meta codes only requires K plus two because if uh, any K out of N uh, completes the computation, we can recover the output. That was the definition of recovery threshold. So here in this case, we only need two M plus one. And this difference will become only bigger and bigger uh, as we go beyond two failure, three failure, and so on. And it's summarized uh, in this graph. So you can see that for building one failure resilience where we don't know required, uh, it's same as replication, but as we want to build more resilience, meta codes uh, perform significantly better. Okay, so now we know that the number of those required is much less for meta codes. But what about the uh, latency overhead for encoding and decoding? So to uh, evaluate this, we ran an uh, ex experiment and uh, most of the experiments were done when I was visiting Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, and I used a cluster which had 40 compute nodes, uh, and each of them had 24 cores, so it had 960 cores in total. And we used each core as one MPI process, which corresponds to one logical node on the grid. And we assume that we know which node has failed. So this is a summary of experimental results. So uh, the x axis is a metric dimension n, and the y-axis is efficient time in seconds. And we, we compare uncoded version, replication, and meta-coded version. So you can see that replication takes a little bit more time than uncoded because you uh, have to generate uh, replicas. And you can see that meta-codes, again, requires a little bit more time than replication uh, for encoding and decoding. But the difference is actually pretty small. So compared to uncoded, the overhead of uh, meta-codes is about 10 to 20 percent. And then uh, compared to replication, the overhead is only about 5 to 10 percent. So in this work, we proposed 3D coded SUMA strategy, which combines 3D SUMA algorithm and meta codes. And this work was through a great collaboration. Six of us, including myself, are from information theory background, and uh, two of us, Christian and Semeng, are experts in HPC. And I think there's so much more that can be done through collaborations like this to bridge the gap between the two fields, and I think our work is just a baby step towards it. Uh, so this is a list of a few future directions that could be explored in the future, and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Heywan, for your uh, wonderful talk. Um, uh, let me look if we have uh, more questions. There are no external questions, but I'm really interested in one one uh, one issue. Maybe it's a little bit stupid <laughs> question. However, as far as I understand, uh, this is um, a method for uh, multiplication um, in, in, in parallel, of course, in, in matrices, uh, the, the regular matrices. Uh, can it be, in obvious way, extended to some other structures, like, for example, tensors? So I think, uh, can you hear me? Yes, 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 it's great. Okay. Uh, so I think that's a great question. Uh, and we actually did think about how this can be extended to tensors and also uh, multiplying many matrices instead of just multiplying like A and B. Uh, and we do have some strategies for that, but those are not as optimal. And I think there could be more ideas to build uh, codes for those uh, different applications.
sorry, sorry, I was. Um, I think you're muted. Oh, yes, <laughs> no. yes, yes, yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Because we, we switch from one uh, to uh, to another. So uh, thank you very much for your for your response. Uh, so the applause for you and for other um, speakers uh, from this session and the previous session. Thank you very much uh, for all the answers. Thank you uh, the audience for uh, all the questions and all your participation. And now you are before uh, the closing ceremony as far as. I understand. So see you. Thank you very much.